Um, so you will take what you wish from this webinar. Um, my aim again is to get just to get you to reflect on your own practices and leave you with more questions than answers. So as I said last week, what works for me um, and Chris and Paul and everybody else on the call, it might not work so seamlessly for others. But what I do hope to pose is some what if questions or I wonder. Um, so I wonder what would happen if I did this. Um, I wonder if I did that, what would happen? And what if this was to take place? So that's the kind of thing that I want you to start thinking about. And I won't be giving you a list of takeaways. Um, again, that would be telling you what to do. And I don't like doing that. So I want you to think for yourself, but also to think about what you're doing in your coaching at nursery level, um, but also how what your club is doing. And hopefully some of the stuff that we're going to discuss will help you in your journey as well as your clubs in terms of the nursery program. So play for me is uh, exploration, creativity, enjoyment, lots of opportunities, a uh, little bit of guidance sometimes, um, guidance from the children or the people that you're coaching, uh, lots of learning, lots of social relationships, speech and language, physical development. But play for me helps people thrive and um, in terms of my own coaching and experiences, I thrive when I'm learning from others and I kind of throw stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And that's what kind of play can be sometimes. And I'll go into a little bit more detail later on. But as you've seen before, if you've had me, you would have seen this um, model of goals and planning decisions for your coaching. So because of my why, so my coaching, planning, delivering, reflecting, making sense of what I'm doing, um, I'm also curious of who I'm coaching. So this webinar, related to this webinar, is it's about children, but then it's about you as coaches and how I can you know, give you a few little tips that might work. But again, the main thing is that you reflecting on what you're coaching um, and obviously how you're coaching. Um, and I do find that this model helps me a lot in terms of my decision making and again, constantly reflecting on my why and why, why I do what I do. So in terms of play and talked a little bit about Netflix and needs and wants last week and I've included Sega in this. Um, now in terms of Netflix, the most person-centered platform there is and when you're coaching children, when you're coaching players, it's important to think about their needs and wants. I'm going to go into more detail on that. Um, in terms of Sega, it brings about, in terms of the research, these two platforms and these two um, organizations have made a big influence on me in terms of my research and how I make sense of it. So again, we'll discuss a little bit more about Netflix and Sega later on. But again, there is always a method to what I'm doing. And no matter, it may seem complete organized chaos, and a lot of my coaching is, but there is always a theme, there is always a rationale for everything I do, no matter how silly or ridiculous it is. So again, just again, just keep that in your head also. So in terms of play, what is play? Um, play is extremely difficult to define. Um, I could give you one definition, however, there is hundreds of definitions on play and there's actually more definitions coming out now there's a lot more research now on play and children in play because of the pandemic and the restrictions and how physical play has um, been forgot about now it was forgot about before the pandemic but the pandemic has accentuated the thought on play and how important it is but there's a few books that I've read and in, in terms of the research just for me to, in terms of my own clarity and understanding of play um Dr Stuart Brown who wrote uh, play how it shaped the brain opens imagination and invigorates the soul brilliant book I have it here beside me um and it's brilliant for children youth and adults but he says that play is a thing of beauty um, and that defining play is like explaining a joke, analyzing it takes the joy out of it. And that's where kind of I feel about play. Um, it's different for everybody. Um, different types of play are going to suit different people. Different types of play are going to suit different coaches. And we'll go into that later on. But within us, play can be constant. And it's how children learn about the world and their surroundings. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, newborn. So when they're laying down, they then 
in terms of learning, they then try and turn over, they then try and sit up, they then try and bum shuffle, they then try and crawl, have tummy time, trying to pull themselves up, they fall, they fall again, they then start to walk again, fall down, they fall a lot, but they're doing all of this is without conscious decision making and understanding what they're doing and why they're doing it. They're just doing it, which is play. And that's what encompasses play for me is children and how they learn. And then as they get older, that play, creativity, whatever circumstances, context can be taken out of them um, by adults usually. Um, And in terms of play, it's the essence of freedom that I would see as well. And um, you can constrain play, and but it needs to be practical. Um, now, it doesn't have to be, I would say, playing, jumping and puddles and stuff. Trial and error, uh, trying to figure something out. That's play. That's a form of play. Um, so again, I can guarantee that there's a lot of stuff that you might think is not play, but then when you think about it and reflect on it and make sense of it, that you are because you're making decisions. Um, so to me, play, it's the art of being free and just doing it without thinking and without understanding what I'm doing. And that is play for me. So the first poll, um, and again, these, I'm going to do a bit of interaction, videos and polls and chats. So the first poll and uh, is for age groups. So just to give me a better idea of what age groups you're coaching. So all of these polls, just before Paul launches the first one, is they're completely anonymous. I have ticked the anonymous box for polls. Um, so be honest. It's just to give me a flavor of where you might be in relation to your coaching, but also in terms of play and your understanding of play. There's no right or wrong answers. Again, it's your rationale, your thoughts, your context. Um, so because it's anonymous, nobody, not even myself, Paul or Chris, will know what you voted for and nobody else will know. So it's just a pretend percentage that will get for each answer. So if you're on a mobile phone or a tablet, you can access the polls in the chat function. If you're on a laptop, the polls will uh, spring up um, in front of you. So Paul, if you could launch the first one, um, and while while the poll is there, guys, again, it's fast finger first. So for the age groups one, you can select more than one answer. So for me, I would be selecting four to seven year olds and adults. They're the two main age groups that I coach and that I enjoy coaching the most and that I am coaching now. Um, but Again, it's whatever context, there's no right or wrong answer. Once you select it, hit submit. So Paul, we'll give it another 10 seconds and then you can vote yourself and then we'll launch the second poll. So so Paul, if you want to vote for yourself and then hit submit, and then once you're uh, happy with that, you can then launch poll two. So poll two is play types. Now, again, there's loads of different research on play and on play types. and. This here game is allowing me to make sense of play. Now, again, I know the answer, so I'm coming at this at at an advantage. But again, there's a method to why I'm doing this. So again, look at the answers, eight, six, or 24. Um, How many play types do you think there is? Select, and then hit submit. Again, Paul will give them about 10 seconds, and then you can vote, and then hit submit. So... I'm not going to ask anybody, I'm not going to ask Paul or Chris what they give because um, they didn't know what the questions are going to be. So um, the number of play types is 16. So if you hit 16, give yourself a little tap in the back. Well done. So um, if you look at all the play types that you have on screen, this is going to be poll three, right? So have a look and out of the 16 play types that you see, um, how many do you, would you include in your coaching right now, or even as a parent? Um, how many of these play types do you see in your uh, in your children, or if you're not a parent, in your nieces and nephews, or your cousins, or children in the street? So again, just have a little scan. Um, so and it's your context. So Paul, Paul, if you just want to again take about ten seconds and then launch it. So again, we'll give everybody f- a few extra seconds. So out of the sixteen play types. Have a think about how many you would be using in your context right now. Not in your coaching. It doesn't have to be in your coaching. All right. So launch poll three there, Paul. And again, guys, vote. So one to two, four to six, I think, uh, seven to ten. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 11 to 16. Um, 
So again, fast finger first, select your answer. And then uh, give your give your answer. Um, while you're doing that, guys, uh, hit submit. While you're doing that, please do not request control of my screen. I know probably people are um, trying to have done it by accident, but there's been a couple of people who've requested control, so please don't. Just keep your fingers away from your phone or your laptop. Um, you're also all of you are unmuted for a reason. Um, it stops the background in, in my so when it stops as well, Chris and Paul having to turn you all off. So in terms of my own coaching, um, when I was looking through the research at the very start and every single day, I would be doing about four or five play types without even realizing it. When I'm coaching, I would probably be about six all the time. But then when I'm focusing on, depending on what age group, if it's three, if it's four to seven year olds, I'm definitely focused on at least 10 or 11 play types. Um, some are easier to incorporate than others. Um, and again, with adults, it will be very similar. But for example, object control that you see in front of your screen. By holding a ball, that's play. Um, you'll see sociodramatic play. So playing house or um, a player being a coach or a referee, that's sociodramatic play. Communication play, as you'll see on the left-hand side, beside pole three, it's talking to each other, asking the coach, asking questions. Um, rough and tumble play could be actually going to the nursery program and being involved in a game or an activity that might have to take the ball of somebody. So again, there's going to be a little bit of contact. So again, um, I'm not going to explain them all, but you can see kind of how they fit in. Now, this is educational research, but again, it fits in nicely in the sporting and coaching as well. So thank you for that. Uh, so in terms of why play, so play is actually a basic international law, human right for children. And uh, some of you might be surprised, it came in in 1989 in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So it's legally enshrined, right to play, um, so the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child guaranteed children's rights in international law. And Article 31 is the right to play. So it's their game, not ours. And Article 31 kind of recognises the importance of play that it's self-directed by the children for the children. So technically, if you're telling children what to do all the time, not giving them an opportunity to think for themselves or make decisions, technically you're going against their human right. All right. So just bear that in mind. Article 12. So Article 12, as you can see, is the right to be heard. So asking their views, asking them uh, what they want or need, asking them their favorite game, what they want to play, how they are, because children have their own views. No matter what age they are, a three-year-old will be able to tell you what they want to do. It mightn't be related to what you want to do as a coach, but asking them, they'll understand in terms of that they might want to play with their friends or they'll want the piece of equipment because they'll want to be, they'll want to explore. So that experience and perspective is extremely important. Again, in terms of Article 12, there's a great um, kind of little quote in, in the research, nothing about us without us. So anything you're doing in terms of coaching, um, nothing should happen without player voice, whether it's children, youth or adults. So asking them and getting them involved. And we'll go, go a little bit more detail later on on that. So, as a coach or as government policy or as a as a play friendly nation, can we be play friendly? Um, so again, in, in terms of my own opinion on this, yes, absolutely. Um, so again, as I, as I mentioned before, even long before the current pandemic, the decline in physical play was being halted um, anyway. Um, and again, I kind of discussed this in in my research in terms of my confirmation registration document, et cetera. But there's several countries that have embedded play policies, not only in their sport, but also in society. And a few uh, countries closer to home, Scotland, have just recently launched a manifesto for play. And Aidan Burns and everybody at Playboard NA, and um, we're doing some great work in terms of building a greater awareness around play. But if we look at, in terms of playing sport and my research, I'm going to go into a little bit later on. Sweden and Norway, for example, have introduced these rights that you see on screen in their sport and practice, right? So again, think about that for a minute. What it says to me 
is that both Sweden and Norway understand that sport and play and coaching is about the child or the player. It doesn't matter what age they are. So if it's on the 15s, on the 16s, they're still a child technically. If it's adults, you know, asking them what their opinion is, asking them to come up with different tactics, um, that's still play. And, um, and there's loads of coaches, NBA coaches, Steve Kerr is one of them, is a very, um, very big believer in giving his players autonomy to come up with decisions, to make decisions regarding the tactics. But you don't have to be an adult coach to do that. Because the child in this is the focal point, not the coach of the sport. So play is the child's agenda. So again, keep that in your head. So I would ask again, in terms of the article 31, or sorry, article 12 as well, is why play? So I'd switch that, why not play? So play is free, it doesn't cost anything, it's in all of us, it's chosen by us, and it's about the moment a lot of the times. So as Jean, B Jean Piaget says, he's a um, play researcher, but an educational theorist. And we should try to develop creative and innovative minds capable of discovery from preschool age onwards throughout life. So again, in terms of this webinar, children and play, and yes, it is focused on the nursery element, but it's play for all throughout life. You know, so we shouldn't think about play as just for children. It's for all of us, you know, and it just we just do it in different ways. So as I said, play is for everyone, children and youth and adults. And in terms of my research on this webinar, you know, I am talking a lot about children, but it's the same premise for adults. The only difference is adults are allowed, adults are better communicating their feelings and their thoughts and their reasons. So if you look, if you switch it, play could be more beneficial for adults. Um, so again, that's a whole other bit of research in terms of, um, that I'm not even gonna go into. Um, but in terms of me and this webinar, um, which fits in terms of Derry GA and the nursery webinar series. I'm focusing on the children, but keep play for all in your head. So in relation to the hat trick and the perfect hat trick, um, as we hear in, in soccer, football, haven't been in New York, I still have to say the soccer club sometimes, and it kind of annoys me, but perfect hat trick, left foot, right foot header. Um, similar in hurling, um, I am football, Left foot, right foot, flicking the ball in. Um, left side, right side, flicking the ball in. Perfect hat trick. And the perfect hat trick in terms of coaching and in terms of the nursery program is the child, parent, coach. And then the child, club, community. All right. So that, if you keep that perfect hat trick in your head, um, it's about teamwork, engagement, connection, relationships, and everybody working together collaboratively. So it's imperative that the environment consists of cooperation and trust. And this is where strong nursery programs and clubs um, having not starting your nursery program on a whim, having a plan, um, everybody knowing the role and um, being aware of what you're going to do on the first night, not just rocking down and saying, here's, a, here's the cards and away you go. You know, so having a plan in place in terms of supporting the parents and the coaches, but also the children, because at four and five years of age, if you can get children in at that age, that conveyor belt from four to five right the way up to adult, finish playing, then stay in the club in terms of administration, that being a coach or a, as a volunteer um, looking after uh, administration or insurance or becoming a uh, treasurer, secretary, whatever it is, um, that is vital. And that starts at four and five years of age and never stops. So... If you're thinking about that, then one of the things that you need to think about is not only the needs and rights of the child, as we talked about before, needs and wants, but also the needs and wants of the coaches, of the club and of the parents. So what do they want out of this? So what do they want their child to gain? You know, confidence, self-esteem, friendships. But that's not only for the child. I can see in the video, some of the videos later on and the video that you know, uh, see that some of you would have seen last week. Building relationships just doesn't happen with children. It's about parents. And again, coach, parent, community, club, community, parent, all of that there comes into it. So it's not just about just the child, everything links and the school club link. Um, all of that is so imperative to get right. Um, next thing then is play. So 
play in terms of sport and in terms of my research, being purposeful. So asking, asking questions, um, getting feedback, and again, uh, planting some questions and planting some games and pretending that uh, you're doing it, that you don't know what you're doing, but you do. And again, we'll go into a little bit more of that later on. But ultimately, what you're trying to do is you're preparing the child for the path rather than the path for the child. So giving the child the tools to think and make decisions and be creative instead of laying the path for them and then them walking ahead on, on it and you doing everything for them. So again, there's a lot of mistakes going to be made, which is fine. But again, it's all about learning. That's how you incorporate that in the nursery program, but also within your club. In the chat function, um, so this is going to be for uh, Chris and everybody else. If you see the uh, physical, social, emotional, sensory, cognitive and communication, what I want you to do is in the chat function, put a number and think about your coaching. And again, if you're not a coach and you're, you haven't started coaching yet, but you want to get involved and you're thinking as a parent or as a teacher or as a, as a relative of young children, when you're playing with them or when you're with them, how many of these areas, physical, social, emotional, sensory, cognitive, and communication, is incorporated into your practice when you're with them? Is it one, two, three, four, or five? Just put a number into the chat, all right? So I'll give you another few seconds, have a think about it, put a number in, and Chris will kind of uh, feed back to me about what numbers are coming through. So any numbers yet, Chris, or what are you thinking yourself? Five, five. Um, I suppose I'm just thinking about my own two children at the moment with this homeschooling going on and the respect that I now have for teachers working with ch younger mm -hmm. children. But, you know, the, the play slide there previously, you know, a lot of drama from the wee girl and um, different elements of play that, I, that they're just getting on with in the living room on their own. So that was really interesting, I suppose. Um, people hopefully are a wee bit more in touch with the younger children now that they've got time to actually go through that type of thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when we talk about physical play, um, you know, connecting socially with them, the sensory stuff, you know, particularly with girls, um, touching things. Um, so, no, no, look, that's um, really topical, I suppose, where I'm at at the minute. A lot of fives here coming through. Right. Um on at the minute, so yeah, most people seem to be seem to be getting that. Yeah, us. Um, that's the first time that I've had people put in five. Um, now I've done this before, and some people may have been on my webinar before. So, um, the first time that it, people have put in five, normally three and fours will come in, and as I said, it's the first time people have put in five. So, well done, everybody else who didn't put five. You're all liars because every single one of you has five all the time. And again, you might just realize how much of each you do, but as you look through them and think about them and reflect on them and what each of them is and when you might have them, you are doing all five. Um, some are easier than others. If you're coaching, it's always going to be physical. You're always doing that. That's an easy one. And as Chris said, Chris talked about the century, which is a really interesting one. Um, UEFA um, have the Playmakers, and it's a, it's a program through Disney to get more gears involved in football. Um, in soccer across the 52 um, associations and it's done through Disney. Um, so imaginative play is very, very much to the fore there and role play. And again, that touch, that touch of a ball, touch of a hurl, that's all sensory. Um, so all of you, if you didn't put in five, you are all five. So you know that for the next thing. Um, but excellent guys. Thank you very much. And Chris, that was, that was brilliant feedback too. So going back to kind of Related to the research, I'm going to just skip over my own research and kind of where I'm coming from. And I've focused, these are the theoretical influences around my own understanding of play in terms of where the literature is and in terms of my own research. And I want you to focus on three of them that you'll see on the screen. So Frederick Froebel, you can read the brief explanation if you want. I'll talk a little bit more about Lev Vygotsky now at the minute, but Maria Montessori. Um, so you would, especially in... Um, in the south of Ireland. And again, in terms of play schools, that would be Montessori education. So as you'll see, independence, observation, following the child, correcting the child, but again, it's through collaborative play 
and you're preparing them to be observant and also to absorb everything around them. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into that because it, it, it is it's a, a bit of a mind explosion. But then that has lent, lent into my research. So my research is on playing sport, understanding the role of play um, for coaches and children. And these are the four main questions that I'm looking at. Um, and the way my research works, it's not a PhD per se, it's a doctor professional practice, which means that I will have project outputs. Um, and my project outputs, um, the first one is the iCoach Kids podcast. And I will have about six to eight episodes directly related to play. Um, and the first one is already up. It's titled The Power of Play with Claire Daniels from the Football Association in England. And uh, it was fascinating. And I would definitely get you to, again, a little bit of a shameless plug. I apologize, Chris. But in terms of play and her definition of play and where she's coming from in terms of play with her children, but also play in her job. And again, the Football Association in relation to the um, Shooting Stars program, which is similar to the Disney program. Um for girls. So then my second project I put is uh, my playing sport framework. And this is ongoing, constantly adaptive. And I purposely use this picture all the time because this is the first kind of draft. Um, so it kind of shows me of where I started to where I am my journey to where I am now. And this here that you see on the screen in terms of physical, cognitive, speech and language and social emotional development it's completely different now. But the rationale behind it is you'll see there's some different play types that you would have seen earlier on. So you have there's object play. And then within that, then you'll see a couple of uh, different activities that a coach could do to incorporate object play. So you'll see there, smaller item, if you're, if you're good eyesight, if, you're, if you can see it, it's for object play, it's using a ball in as many different ways. So that is object play. And, and then there's another one, uh, use a ball as many different, uh, in, with different body parts, a different piece of equipment at different speeds, and then using only your hands and feet. Right? So there's the four, there's four areas for object play. And again, it's just giving them um, some help in terms of design and practices, thinking about play types, what you can observe and change. Um, if you want to bring in different aspects of play, so storytelling, more imaginative play. But again, it just gives you that um, extra few tools that will help you. And then my final one, which is the biggest one, which won't be probably coming out until after the research, is a playing sport practical, free, practical workshop. And this is where Chris and Derry GA and all the webinars I do are helping me in terms of my research because I am building up so many resources in terms of webinars and previously in terms of workshops and conferences that I would have done before the pandemic and uh, for the GA, for Ulster GA, within my role, previous role with Ulster GA, all of those are building up a bank of resources that are going to help me in terms of a playing sport workshop. Um, now, how it is incorporated and how it's adapted is coming from the research in terms of the coaches. So even though I will have a playing sport workshop after the workshop and every time I do a workshop, I'll have to change it because my research is constantly adaptive and it's action research. So it has project outputs, but there's a little bit of critical realism in that, that um, my uh, place in terms of the research and my opinions and context going to be different from Chris's and Paul's, for example or Ashley, who, Ashley McCall, who's on this call as well, it's going to be completely different to hers, which is then going to affect my workshop. So it's a little bit of a, as I said, a bit of a mind explosion, um, but that constant adaptive and constant refining is what you do in coaching. So it's not going to be finished completely. Um, and that's fine because uh, not that I'm making mistakes, but I'm constantly learning and figuring things out and trial and error and I'll try that, that's interesting. So we'll include that in the workshop. And again, that is gonna help me, but also hopefully help coaches in relation to their understanding of play. And then just to think about how they can incorporate play in terms of sport. One of the, going back to a little bit about the research and again, for me to make sense of my own research and make sense of play and to help you make sense of play, 
I like using characters and cartoons and a few people that you will know. So obviously you know um, Buzz Lightyear. And Scott Herbal um, talks about six basic elements of play. And each time when someone is fully involved in play, there are six areas. And the first one is anticipation. So ignition. So that initial spark, Buzz Lightyear, waiting with expectation, a little bit of wonderment of what's to come. So curiosity, not knowing what's going to happen. Um, and you as a coach, not knowing what's going to happen in your session. You'll be planned, but your plan could go straight out the window five minutes later. So that constant motivation and constant anticipation and um, thinking that you're going to have fun is really, really uh, important. And then that leads to then uh, surprise. So Tom and Jerry, now the surprise in the research and in terms of Scott Airbrill and the basic elements is is positive but then it, it could be the opposite so surprise in terms of not having enough numbers not having enough coaches not having enough equipment that could be surprise but it's about the unexpected it's surprise in terms of discovering something new which then leads and can lead to pleasure and again depending on what the surprise is the pleasure could be fear <laughs> but in terms of working with children a lot of the time it is pleasure, smiling, they're good fun, even when they are making mistakes and they're doing things, um, running around and messing about, it's still good fun, it's good crack. But the pleasure coming from satisfaction as well, and satisfaction that things might be going so well, but satisfaction that you've changed things to make it better, that you've learned something. But knowing that you're having a positive impact, even though you think it might be working, the children are enjoying it, they're smiling, you may think it's going rubbish, but again, they're smiling, they're enjoying it, keep it going. Then that leads then to understanding. So the aha moment, the epiphany. So the acquisition of new knowledge, and again, an understanding of something that was completely incomprehensible before. A new problem or a new skill that was very difficult or a new concept, and you're able to do it. Yes, I know how to do that. Brilliant. So that's the understanding. Then that leads to Tony, and that leads to strength. And Tony, for me, used to work with Tony and with Ulster GA. He epitomizes strength, especially in his former playing career, but also having been involved with him in terms of the interfirms and him as a as a coach and a manager when, with Ulster GA in terms of the interfirms, that character, skill. And in the research, Tony would be think would be mastery. So again, come from understanding, but the experience of going through tough times, having played football in the Hurling, club, intercounty, all-star, everything out there, as well as overcoming challenges. So that then leads to um, Elsa. Now, I'm not saying Tony is Elsa, but leads to poise. So fulfillment, contentment, composure, and grace. And once poise is reached, so once Elsa, once Elsa is reached, we are ready then to go back on the roller coaster of play and to start all over again, whether it's coaching or whether it's players. Now, you mightn't start back at Buzz Lightyear, okay? You could be fighting something difficult, going through the levels, as we're going to talk about after, and then you're at, you're not at a high yet, you're not at understand yet, but you're very close. So you come in that understanding. Um, and again, it's, Children, coaches, you're all within this continuum at one stage. Um, and it's good to be aware of it. And again, it's research-based, research-focused as well. So it's going to help you in terms of understanding your own context and trying to make sense of where you are and where the child might be. Um, so one person that you're going to hear from next week is uh, Professor Richard Cheatham, who's on with me um, in the final webinar uh, for... Uh, fam the family games and Richard discusses that play is learning and it's again similar continuum now I know he's going to go in a little bit more detail later on but he talks about the conditions of play and the children learn as they play and most profoundly in play children learn sorry, children learn how to learn and again Richard will go into a little bit more detail on that in relation then to bringing it back to the GA context so I'm not going to go through the player pathway framework or the, or the Cal, Talent Academy and player development review that 
um, Eugene Young was involved with and um, uh, Brian Cuthbert. But what came out of it um, has been very beneficial and I see it being beneficial in terms of you as coaches and especially the nursery program. Um, because the foundation element is where most coaches and most players are going to fit in. And especially in terms of this webinar, it'd be F1. So the nursery element. And again, that fundamentals of that we looked at last week with myself and Terence. And then looking at play, have a ball, all of the different resources that GA have, all of the stuff that Derry GA have, Ulster GA, Dublin GA, etc., Leinster GA, um, the Gaelic Star program that we went over will then link into uh, the Go Games and into the Family Games next week, which will touch on F2, which then will lead on to F3, which is then um, youth and adult. But specifically for this webinar, I'm focusing on the child, on F1. But again, just in terms of how it fits, you can go and look at it in terms of yourself. But in terms of the recommendations, the two biggest ones were the three of them in relation to you is obviously the player pathway framework, which is this. Education, so providing new opportunities um, to become better coaches, better practitioners. Uh, the governance element, I'm not too worried about that for this webinar, but then definitely key recommendation for a games program. Coordinated, coherent games for everyone. And that's where the F1, F2, F3 come in, especially for you. So read that yourself, brilliant document. And it is going to be I mean, great now in the GA, COVID is um, kind of restricted a little bit, but it will be coming in. So it's good to have a little, um, a little read over too. So a couple of last few things, last few minutes, and I just want to go through a few videos. So the, there's no sound, so I'm going to talk over the videos. Just watch and have a think. So uh, Maggie and Valorant talk about supportive, audio, audio, autonomous supportive relationships and autonomous support, supportive environments. And play gives coaches and children the opportunity to embrace the idea of autonomy supportive environments. So it's something that can have a powerful impact on the development of intrinsic motivation as children get older. But as you can see on the screen, there's a webinar that I did with Hertfordshire GA in England before it was my last workshop face to face before lockdown. And autonomy supportive is not just for children, it's for adults. And again, this video that you would have seen last week, different context, autonomy supportive. If you watch, there's lots of choice. There's within specific limits and rules because we're inside, parents are there, so the children are not going bananas. But again, there's a lot of noise happening there and you can't really hear it. Um, there's a rationale for the tasks. Um, people who were on would know that my overall theme for that, this is handling. Um, there's lots of inquiry. There's asking them how they're feeling, asking them how they're getting on. Um, but there's not so much about control. It's about giving them autonomy. Um, and again, I have the research, it's in the references then, you can go into more detail, you can ask me for it, we can talk about it more. But thinking about um, that research, as well as what I want you to kind of think about in terms of the next set of polls and the next story. So it comes back to Lev Vygotsky and Sega and Levels and collaborative player and coach or player and teacher working together. So. Level one, you're playing uh, the Xbox or Sega or the Nintendo or whatever you're playing, and you have to go from level one to level two to level three. There might be 30 levels. And each level gets progressively more difficult. So that's called scaffolding in, in terms of the research. And Sega and uh, Nintendo is a great way for me to think about collaborative challenge. So I'm not uh, making it too hard that they can't get to the next level. I'm not making it too easy that, it's, that they can beat the big boss so simply. But coaching um, is a partnership with rather than an instructional presentation to. So think about that again. Ask some questions, getting their feedback rather than saying, here's what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And it's all about the coach. It's all about me. It shouldn't be that. It's all about the person. It's all about the child who you're coaching. So going back to thinking about what Terence talked about later on. So I'm going to talk about three approaches similar to what you've seen there now. Discovery, collaborative and purposeful. And I want you to think about when I'm talking about it, where it fits in for you um, and which one, which approach 
what you do um, to better best suit the needs of your players or your children at home if you were to do a session tomorrow or to go out and play. And I've taken Terence's picture from last week, an example. So approach one. Um, approach one for me is discovery, right? So if you can imagine that uh, this here is all set up, right? Yet I'm doing show me, have a go. Um, here's the equipment, go make up uh, your games. Now, I will do that during the warm up. Yet if I have set all this up in the picture, it'll be messed up. So there's a few different ways to do it. Um, and the first one, if you can think about that, there's no games here, but that I put them all in groups. I send them to each of the areas that you see. So uh, Ashling, Paul, Chris, and me are up in the area where the squats and medicine balls is. That's our area, but we can make up our own game. I give them, uh, and we've got our equipment. Each of us makes up our own game. Each one of us has two minutes to make up a game. Whatever we decide to do, the rest of the group has to take part and help out, okay? So that would be discovery for me. Game design, right? Then we move into collaborative. And collaborative would be what you see here. So I set all these games up. I'm the head coach. I come in, set everything up. I start at the endurance runs. So they're in there. Uh, we go around all the games. Uh, so we go from endurance to sprint, to agility, to shoulder, to 4v4, and all the way down, all the way up to squats. Go around all the games, bring everybody around with us, explain all the games, show them how it's played. And then we go right back to the very start. And then I go, oh, I can't, oh, I can't remember. What do we do here? And then Paul puts up his hand and goes, hey, so uh, we, have to, we have to race our teammates. We have to race the people in the other team. Brilliant. Paul, you're the captain of endurance runs. And then uh, that's then Lena tells the next, we go to the next game, sprint relay, and Chris puts his hand up. And, oh, we're, we're, we're uh, racing against uh, the other team. And, uh, and then, right, Chris, you're the captain of sprint relay. So then the coach is working with them. So as you see on the screen, there's a coach at each one, but the coach is asking them how they could change the game, um, what they could do to make it more purposeful, but again, thinking about that it's their decision. And then the last one is purposeful, and this is more coach with the child. So uh, you're bringing them around again, but it's more focused in terms of a skill or what they need. So all the games are related to a certain skill, whether it's handling, whether it's striking, whether it's kicking, whatever it is. Um, but that's more kind of maybe to do with you have to go purposeful because you don't know them that well and you don't know that Chris Collins and Paul Tolan you cannot put them in the same group as each other because they'll mess about they'll upset the rest of the group you have to split them up and you don't know that yet but if you tell them what the games are the coach says listen here's the game we're going to play we're going to play it for a few minutes and then I'm going to give you a little bit of you're going to give me some feedback but you're going to change the game as well that helps with behavior um, and it shows that the coach is in control, but there's a lot of, if there's a purpose and a reason behind it, but also that once the coach gets to know the players more and once it feels confident and comfortable, then the coach can maybe give them a little bit more leeway. And for children that you don't know, or if it's a challenging group, purposeful is really, really a good way to go. So again, Paul, if you could launch poll four. So, Vote again, guys. Again, it's anonymous. If you're on a mobile phone or a tablet, you'll have to go into the chat. So which one would you be? Discovery, collaborative, or purposeful if you were to do a session tomorrow? So while you're doing that, vote and then hit submit. Uh, for the video that you would have seen with Rockland GA previously, that's obviously discovery, but it started off as purposeful. Um, a lot of the time, um, I have kind of where I am a lot of the time, majority of the time, and just have to think about where you are. So Paul, when you're ready, you can vote for yourself and hit submit. And again, guys, if you haven't voted yet, you can go into the chat function, vote, hit submit, and then we'll move on. So again, just to finish off, um, for me, I am collaborative all the time, whether it's four-year-olds, three-year-olds, adults, and I'm collaborative to the point of not pretending that I haven't a clue what I'm doing. 
all right? And there is a there is a reason for it, a rationale for it, but I want to see what they're going to come up with. And in the videos, in the videos that you're seeing now, um, so play is not a reward. It's an essential ingredient in child and skill development, but also for adults. This is an in, an in service that I did with the Ulster GA coaches. Um, this here is an in service that I did with Dublin GA before starting my role. So, as I said, it's not a reward. However, play is for everyone. Even though this webinar was tailored to play for you as coaches in the nursery setting, never forget that it's important that we all play. And the video that you see right now is my wife catching me out jumping in puddles. Right? But again, play is for everyone. And you'll see the smile on my face, brilliant crack. Right? She thinks I, she just had a look of astonishment that I was doing that. But again, method, reason, rationale. So for this, I've hope that I've posed some what if or I wonder questions. But I would get you to look at other sports, look up. Um, watch other sports, observe other coaches, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, videos, books. I have a stack of books here beside me, um, books and research that's on this um, webinar as well. Conferences, the fact that you're here, guys, is brilliant. Um, if you have a mentor, brilliant. If you don't have a mentor, get a mentor. Just somebody that can bounce ideas off. Ask questions of them, but also ask questions of the players and the children that you're working with. Never stop learning. All right, because development never stops. Keep it in perspective. All right, so right now we all kind of have a chance to be a future maker and be Promethean. And what I mean by being Promethean, um, Professor Jim McKenna, who was on my assessment from a PhD, talks about um, Prometheus. And Prometheus was a demigod, a Greek god, and uh, he was thrown out <laughs> because he was boldly original. He was creative, too creative. So again, that's where play fits in for me. And you as a coach, take a chance. You've ventured outside your comfort zone. Never forget that. By being here, by being a coach, never forget that. Stay positive no matter what. Enjoy the journey. Embrace the chaos. And come me and for your attention. I hope none of you are feeling like Homer Simpson at the minute. Um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you for joining me. And... Here's a few references that Chris will be sent on after in terms of the presentation. So I'm going to have a wee drink of water. I'm going to unshare my screen and get ready for some of the questions that uh, have come in, I hope. Um, I'm actually going to vote here. So the, it's in front of me. So I voted. And I'm going to hit done. Hi. All right, good man. On. Um, folks, if anybody's got any questions, you can put them under the chat box there and we'll Bring them up. One from Gavin McGigan here, on. Is that your wife's jammy bottoms you're wearing? <laughs> Good man, Gav. Hope you're keeping well, sir. Um, no, I have. And actually, pajama bottoms and lounge pants. Game goes back to play. So I was telling you a little story. I was my two of three nephews and a few nieces, but the two nephews are, are good fun. They're good crack. Never want to go to bed. So I was watching um watching they wouldn't go to bed further nanny so my mother no and i could hear her in the kitchen going oh boys come on come on let's go put on our pajamas and i'm thinking mary you want them to go to bed don't tell them don't say you would you like to put on your pajamas just go down and have to put them on that's it so she was struggling so i went back in and i said listen lads come on down sure i'll put my pajamas on if you put yours on and i had three pairs actually with me because uh, we were living in galway at the time so um, I just said, listen, right, lads, come on down. You put yours on, but you can choose which ones I have. So literally, as soon as I said, they were straight down, jammies on, into the living room, not a peep out of them. And again, asking questions, then making decisions, all comes back to play, Gavin. There's a method of madness and a rationale for everything, lad. That looks like it's going to be the hardest question you have tonight, on. <laughs> I'm just kind of um, going to... You were talking about the F1 and F2 of the pathways earlier. Yeah. You referred to resources across multiple sites. Where is your go-to for coaching nursery kids? Oh, and that's from good Mark. question. Good question, Mark. Um, for at the minute, uh, Gaelic Start, and again, having been, having been involved in it and involved in um, putting it together with Townsend and with everybody else, brilliant resource. 
Um, everything's there. Everything's ready to rock. Uh, Dublin G are ready to play. Um, a lot of the stuff in terms of I would use a lot of basketball um, sessions. Barry Milan just released a um, game-based a uh, coaching ebook. So loads of people on Twitter. Um, Gavin McGee. <laughs> uh, Gavin would be one as well. Um, very creative coach also. Mentoring would be a really good one in terms of not resource, but being able to kind of bounce ideas off somebody if you have an idea. Um, probably the biggest one as well is having a go at something. You know, trying something out. I have a ton of stuff. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, I'll send you a few things on. Um, Special Olympics is another one. So Special Olympics have a lot in terms of their inclusive approach and inclusive games and activities. And the GA as well in relation to um, Jeremy Tavish and her role as a diversity and inclusion officer. So Gaelic start, uh, right, ready to play. Uh, I would look at as well, give us a game, Joe Connor and a lot of the stuff that Ulster GA are doing. Martin, we're going to take these webinars and put them into a nursery resource off the Dairy website um, and we'll put links of the stuff that's accessible already online onto that um, and maybe sign host people to the likes of Jure's book and various books that are that are tailored for this age group. So hopefully the new micro site will be a one stop shop. We'll include these webinars, etc. And that'll be an opportunity for you to go and pick the things up. So hopefully that helps. Um, question from Michael, great, present, great, great presentation on um, any tips that have worked well for you when trying to get parents as active as possible in the sessions? Uh, good question. So I'll give you two scenarios there, Michael. In previous role with Ulster GA, um, we would have done kind of parent workshops. So bringing the parents in and the reason for the Gaelic Star program was to get more parents involved. So technically the children were the guinea pigs. It was to get more coaches involved, more people involved in the club and create that school club link, that club community. Um, so having parent workshops or parent engagement evenings, again, it doesn't have to be practical. It could be theory based. And we've done the same in Rockland, brought them in and basically went through a rationale of why going to look through doing through things to play why i want parents involved um why it's beneficial for their children if the parent is involved actively within the club don't have to coach just even by bringing them down and staying talking to other parents that's going to be a massive influence because that parent is then going to have social relationships with other parents make friends they're going to want to come back as well to meet their, you know so all of that is linked as i talked about earlier on um, and in relation then to the more coaching element, so uh, Terence talked about it a little bit last week, and if you weren't on it last week, so let's say you have Chris Collins. Chris is a really experienced coach, nursery program, flying, and uh, Paul Tolan, uh, newbie, new parent, new coach, just comes down, wants to get involved, but isn't sure. And the head coach, who is you, Michael, you go over and you ask Paul, when you get involved, and Paul's not sure. You say, well, just will you go over and help Chris? The Chris is head coach. He's looking after that, but just go over and support him. Basically just saying that you don't want the crowd over there. It's basically crowd control more than anything. And then Chris might give Paul a little nudge, you know, just you know, give him a little extra responsibility or ask him, Paul, how would you change this game? There's Paul coaching straight away and you have them straight away. Um, if they don't want to get involved, that's fine. And again, ask, don't ask, you don't get. Um, if, if they do say no, ask them again. If they say no a second time, then may, you may want them to take the administration or if you're charging, taking the money, taking the role, whatever it is, but get them involved. Um, and again, by getting them involved, it could be just a say, case of how are you? How are you doing? Good to have you here. That's getting them involved. So you're creating that connection. Okay, great. And Michael, we, we're going to do a couple of case studies as well. Um, I've got couple of case studies, just some really good examples of nurses that are going on around the county. So we've got Mark McLaughlin from Marafelt lined up to do a video that'll be part of the resource. Um, and he talks about having people in various positions around Metabank to try and get you know parents off the off the side of the pitch and get them on. Um, so he'll come up with a few strategies that have worked for them and we'll share them then when we get this pulled together. Killian Connor, I think, might have a question here. He's just typing. 
Okay, we'll go. We'll go one more because I'm mm -hmm. aware of time. So I'm up to fifty six minutes. Yeah. And again, I want to. Oh, no, we could probably go a little bit over, Chris, because I started the recording late. Because I wanted it to be an hour, so just for yourselves, yeah, you're you're and watch it back. Killian, do you want to unmute your mic and? Oh, Killian, I know he'll not be able to. Oh, we'll see. He's just typing something here at the moment. So just going back to Ken and Michaels in terms of engaging children, the youngest children, puppets are a good way of doing it. Obviously, just be aware of the age. If it's if they're five or six and they have brothers and sisters that they know what a puppet is, they let you down a bag full by shouting that it's a puppet. And everybody else, all the other children don't realise it's a puppet. So they're playing along. So that can be that can be good fun as well. And all the resources and a lot of things that I use are used for adults as well. Don't use the puppets, but I use head the ball. And if um, practical workshops is easier, but can I, as I said, just having a go at some and just getting people involved. No, that's great. He's going to hold off to the next one there, Owen. So cool. So we'll do one more question, Chris, up. just and then we'll finish up. If there's another question in, great. If not, then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, that's you, sir. Class. Um, guys, again, so I. Uh, I've, Chris, has, Chris said he's putting it together um, as a as a resource. If anybody wants to get in contact with me and discuss some of the things a little bit in more detail, um, please, you're more than welcome. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for Chris again for having me on. For those who have been here for two weeks, um, I apologize for next week, but Richard will be the main show next week as Terence was last week. Thanks for Paul Tolan, uh, intern with Dublin GA in the background, helping out with Chris and myself also. And again, of course, Chris, brilliant for having me on. And Derry GA, you're helping me in terms of my research, um, in terms of playing sport, workshop and future. So really appreciate it. And Jeannie and Skip really appreciate it too. Top stuff. Thanks, Owen. Um, thanks, everybody, for logging on. And again, we're on next week, um, Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock. Um, these webinars will be recorded and then shared um, at a later date. But do your best to get on because... The more interaction there is, obviously, the better for everybody. So thanks again, Owen, for putting that together. I really enjoyed that this evening. Um, just on a side note, um, Owen talked about Play For All, our Go Games program. Um, we actually launched that during the week. Now, that's going to be uh, sent out to clubs in due course. Um, but we're looking at Saturday, the 10th of April, as our, as our date to begin. Obviously, with um, we have to see how the COVID thing works out and... Um, how the two jurisdictions can marry things together. But Saturday the 10th of April is what we're aiming for at the minute. And I suppose the message tonight is, you know, play for all. And um, that's really key in terms of when it comes to the Go Games. So hopefully we can get our kids out playing games this summer. Um, I think everybody's at the stage where we need to get out of the house and, and let them play again. So that was that. And thanks a million on for that. <laughs>